one of them in particular was quite deranged. You can you say know? it. They're they're not tier one players. I think FNS was just preempting this chamber buff that's coming, and he knew he needed space for Ye. I'm just, and I'm not I'm, doubting I'm that. Putting this out there, he outfragged texture at every event. And I would tell you to re-evaluate your eyes because you've got a player who's fucking overheating all the time. Hello and welcome everybody. It's your favorite Valorant podcast. Although it might not be your favorite, but it's pretty close to the top of your favorite Valorant podcast. It's Cosmic Divide. It's episode 37. I'm Elevated, joined by TMV. We've got a lot to talk about today. TMV, what's happening? Yes. What's happening? Uh, we got some Valorant news. Um, we got Ascension tournaments. We got... DMV thinking that the month of September was not going to be so busy for him, but it turns out it's actually maybe even more busy than August was. You know, <laughs> a lot of a lot of stuff going on. Uh, a lot of st- I've kind of gone off the rails. Uh, if you watch some of our recent videos, they've kind of been one of them in particular was quite deranged. Uh, you do some nice story little art art house editing stuff. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> You're becoming a real filmmaker using using that uh, that. What was it? You were a theater kid degree, right? Something like yes. that. Yes. Good stuff. Yeah, I've been doing voices and all sorts. Um, <laughs> really, that was, you know what, that, that video that I did a couple of days ago, a lot of people asked me, like, oh, has he just gone off the rails? Like, why why did you do this? And really, it was because I did, I, I tried to do about four different videos that day. I had no idea what I was going to make the video about. And then I just decided, what if I just was, just went crazy? You know what? I just gave in to kind of like, you know the the voices in my head i guess just saying like what if you just did a weird voice and you know talk about people, people making mistakes. what they want yeah. they want an oiled yeah. up funny voiced <laughs> tmv god the 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 calls for oiling up are getting louder and louder as well i thought you know it's one of those things that you think like oh that'll go away you know like probably after the season people will stop saying it the calls are just getting louder um but I will remain do. resolute, resolute in my uh, defiance to the people. You gotta just start trolling your chat and your YouTube comments. Like, just opening shot of your stream or a video is just like one of those squeezy bottles with like uh, a yeah. little post-it note that says oil on it, and just like leave it yeah. there for thirty seconds, and then you just come in, like slap <laughs> yeah. it out of the way, start the stream. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I might do that. I might do that. Uh, anyway, shall we talk about some Valorant stuff? Should we talk Valorant? Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, okay. Let's get into some Valorant stuff. We're going to start with Roster Mania, which I think always surprises people how much... Like, every year it's like, oh, yeah, some changes will happen. Then everyone's like, whoa, so much is already happening. Like, whoa. Well, yeah, that's just how it works in esports, I think. I think because we get used to sports, yeah. and in sports, you know, like, superstars stand tend to stay with their team and it's like a big deal if they move whereas in esports because everything's kind of a bit more unstable let's say uh you know pe- big players leave teams all the time yeah uh, and, and i think and i think places. even beyond like the big players in sports generally speaking people sign you know three four year contracts even if yeah. they're kind of like the role players so there will yeah. be some free agent moving around but a lot of the times like i actually just finished reading this book by phil jackson um the legendary basketball coach who coached like michael jordan's bulls and shaq and kobe's lakers and he was talking about some of like the roster moves and oftentimes it would just be like people who like you know played five minutes every like third game or something like that that were changing between mm. seasons so, like the core of the team yeah. generally would stay the same throughout year to year even if they like bombed out of the playoffs and stuff but yeah in esports it definitely seems like unless you're literally like tens <laughs> or like the face of your organization there's always room for improvement and mm-hmm. everybody seems to be desperate to find the wins now as opposed to building something long term Yes, so let's get into some of these changes. The big one, I think the most notable one that most people have seen is Durka. Uh, Durka leaving uh, now. I didn't even hear about this other one, but you put it on here that Mini has also retired from coaching, which obviously isn't a shock considering, you know, obviously this past year he took a step back anyway. So not a shock that that has happened. Um, but let, let's talk about Fnatic then. Durka leaving. Now, when I first heard that, I was really quite surprised then as i thought about it more i became less surprised Mm -hmm. uh the reason that i say that is because at first it's like oh my god dirk is leaving like you know you think 
Dirk has been there forever. He was there at the first Reykjavik alongside Bolster, you know. And not only is he, like, leaving and he's been there forever, but also he's really good. Yeah. You know, like, he, he's really good. Even if you are a bit of a Dirk a hater and you don't think that he's, like, amazing, you can probably understand that he is much better than most players. <laughs> yeah, and he kind uh, of had a resurgent year this year, too. Like, he yes. had a little bit of a downtime in 2023 towards the end like which is funny to say because obviously Fnatic was really good in 2023 but i wouldn't say it was like off the back of durka it was more like alpha yes. and leo kind of carrying the team a lot of the time and chronicle yes. um and durka was just kind of like a role player but this year he really kind of stepped back up it seemed like especially once leo departed for health issues yeah. uh, like at champions durka was b by far one of the best players at the event uh at stage two he was really really good so yeah this is this was definitely kind of surprising to me uh, but the reason that I say it wasn't, the reason I wasn't as surprised is because fifth, sixth, so Fnatic in their last two tournaments finished fifth, sixth, I think, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's just not good enough. Yeah, that's right? true. That's just not good enough. And, okay, like, if Leo is coming back, which we can assume is going to happen, like, who would you change, right? They're not going to change Bosley. He's the face of Fnatic, as you said. Like, that's off the table. Chronicle probably was their best player. Leo was arguably the best player in the world before, you know, last year. Mm -hmm. Alpha is seen as one of the best players in the world. Like, who who would you replace, right? And, and the answer probably you would end up with if you are Fnatic, it probably is Durka, even though, as you said, like, he had a resurgence specifically like the second half of the year. He was really, really good. Um, the question that I would have, though, is for Fnatic, who are you going to bring in Yeah, that is definitely going to be an improvement? Yeah, that is, I and mean, I don't think that is a. I don't think there is a, a true answer that is definitely going to be better than Durka. Yeah, I mean, I think what people are gonna do is they're gonna, you know, they're gonna look at like the Ascension tournament, right? Like, oh, this kayak guy on Apex is going crazy, right? You know, they're yeah. gonna look at the Ascensions in America and like, oh, whoever is popping off, it's not comparable. <laughs> like this, this is a no. guy who has won multiple trophies. This is a guy who has been on the biggest stages many, many times, stepped up when necessary. And I think still really importantly, this is a guy who can play Jet and Raze without any fall off in performance. And also, and, Yoru, and honest, now has Yoru. expanded his, his yeah. agent pool to Yoru and has weathered like an up and down season. Like, I just really don't know if there is a better option for this particular mm. role in this team. I think I said this when I saw the news and I'd be curious to get your take on this. I think probably it comes down to either replacing Durka or Alfier. If, if they're looking at um, sort of like making a change to maybe make their team better. Um, I, I really don't think you replace either of the supportive players in terms of Leo or mm -hmm. Chronicle, assuming Leo comes back at full health. And for me, I would replace Alfier in a heartbeat over take over over replacing Durka, just because I think that the um, sort of like the sentinel crop of players out there is much stronger than like really fully developed duelist players. And mm -hmm. also, I think that um, Alfier as a player, to me, I thought he regressed a little bit this year. I thought that he was more prone to making over aggressive bad plays uh than he had been in 2023 and at the same time i thought durka played better than 2023 this year at a, at a lot of points so yeah i mean that might sound crazy to a lot of people replace alfier um but if i had to choose between the two of them i would have stuck with durka and let alfier explore options but i think also this was not fanatic making a change i think this was durka wanting to do something else mm. that's i mean that, is, that, that is... i got okay yeah i mean that 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 well that's interesting from durka's perspective as well like where does he think he's gonna go that is gonna give him a better chance of winning than fanatic you know i mean that's also a a fair question i think i think it's a, a risk but uh if, if that is what's happened, that'll be, that would be interesting. Obviously, someone's going to pick Durka up, and honestly, it's every, literally every team, I think you said he's open to moving to pretty much everywhere, but China, like every single team in every single league, pretty much, unless you're, you know, one of the very top teams, should be thinking, you know, let's, let's bring in Durka. Um, yeah.
And you know what's interesting as well? One thought that did come into my head is, huh, Team Heretics, you're now you're now gonna see the problems with with nepotism. <laughs> is that it's gonna be you can't you can't replace Mini Boo mm. with you, someone you, who's you better. You'd replace Mini Boo with Durka, huh? I'd take the better player. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I yes, guess... I would, but they probably can't because he has his brother on the team and he's your IGL and replacing him probably would mean replacing both of them. Uh, yeah. So yeah, probably not going to happen. Probably I'm dreaming. And I'm not a Miniboo hater. I think Miniboo's good, yeah. but I think Dirk is better. And I think if you're looking to win a tournament and you could upgrade a player, you should take it, but they probably can't. Uh, that's just yeah. a thought, but yeah. Someone's going to build... I mean, you're probably going to build a team around Durka. If I was Durka, and I said this, I think, in my video reacting when this uh, thing came out, is I would just learn Neon. Like, because if you can mm. get Neon in there as well, like, if you spend this offseason, like, grinding Neon and learning that as well, then pretty much no matter what happens, unless Riot fundamentally, you know, brings out Valorant 2 or something, <laughs> then you're pretty much secure. No matter yeah. what they do. They nerf yeah. raise, you're fine. You know, they, they, they buff Yoru or whatever, like, you're fine. You'll be in the best spot ever then. Uh, to play, you know, all of the duelists, which is, as you said, like, there is no one else. If Durka learns Neon, which I would say is easier than learning Yoru, then no other player that I know of or can think of can play Jet, Raze, Neon, and Yoru. Yeah. So if he can do that at a decent level, like, that would be super valuable no matter what happens uh, to the duelist method going forward. So yeah, I'm sure so. I'm sure Durka will be fine. I'm 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 more interested personally from the fanatic perspective. Right, like Durka's gonna who's coming in? Is it going to be like a narrate? Is it going to be, you know, some some cracked tier two player? Yeah, it, I mean, who knows? Um, one other yeah. thing that is maybe worth talking about is that it's not a free agent. It's a restricted free agent, which means that there yes. very likely is a buyout means that Fnatic has the opportunity to probably say no. They can probably have the opportunity to match the the offer. So I guess there is some world where he's too expensive because I, from what I've mm. seen, teams are very hesitant to pay buyouts yeah. right now. Like there's not a yeah. lot of money to pay buyouts. So maybe there is some world where nobody wants to pay for an expensive player like Durka and he ends up, in limbo i guess that's possible unless bleed decide <laughs> here's a player who's actually worth giving the money to wow yay slander all right moving on before the yay <laughs> the yay fans take over the comment section that would be a good move bleed honestly if you do just have stacks of cash to burn this is the this kind is the of the player. player that you want yeah especially when you now need to do well to stay in the league Right, so it's even more important this season that they actually do True. well. What, uh, would so, you yeah. scrim with Durka or just sign him outright? Is the question. You know they got <laughs> burnt before. I I would like if I was building that team, I would say, well, we're building the team around Durka anyway. Mm -hmm. He's the starting point, and yeah. everything else is periphery. Just, just right so a I would start with the. If I was bleed, I wouldn't scrim with him because I would be like, well, I know you're on the team. Yeah, because okay. <laughs> I want you uh so yeah that's that's what i would do even though they did get burned by that last year but also yay didn't have a a great season before they signed him whereas durka did so there you go true uh shall we move on to i mean this is pretty big news as well to be honest yeah uh, th there's sadder. actually more roster moves than the ones that i i listed but i i focused on the biggest ones there's there's a lot yeah. of big news honestly <laughs> yeah sadak is leaving loud uh and there have been rumors of him going to crew Mm -hmm. uh, that's not confirmed, but those are rumors. But he's definitely out of loud, which leaves us with again a couple different things to talk about. One, let let's start with the loud perspective of this. This is a massive loss for yes. loud, in my opinion. Uh, one of the main reasons I think this is a massive loss for loud is because there hasn't been, or I don't know if there is, any amazing Brazilian IGLs. Correct. So that's a problem. Yep. <laughs> that's a big problem. So it's kind of almost irreplaceable, is Sadak, which is not great when you have to replace him. Yeah. It sounds like you agree. Yeah. And, and not only that, not only have we, I don't think we've seen a single really, really good Brazilian IGL so far in Valorant. 
like just straight up i don't think there's been one that's like yes this guy is is like a really really good igl um but sadok also bridges the gap to spanish speaking players right so mm -hmm. he kind of not that they would necessarily do this but he also did kind of potentially open up the opportunity to access like all of latin america right because you would mm -hmm. think that somebody who can speak portuguese and spanish and english would maybe be able to integrate any player from that player pool but now it's like all right are we are we back to like what seems to be maybe like a shrinking talent pool of brazilian players to build yeah and hopefully maintain the legacy of loud um which is uh definitely worrying for not not just loud but the overall brazilian scene because if, if sonic does go to you know crew which is where i think makes the most sense for him to to go just yep. because i think on his stream he was talking about how he like kind of wants to go home for the end of his career it's like well go back to argentina which is where crew is from and you know go hang out with uh with messi <laughs> and get get the messi <laughs> yeah. bag um it makes a lot of sense for Sadak, but yeah, definitely, definitely leaves all of Brazil kind of in a rough spot. Yeah, yeah. If if Crew did get Sadak, that would be that would be a big win. Yeah, uh, for Crew, because again, that's kind of what you know. I mean, last year they had Klaus or Melsa IGLing or no one at <laughs> at right. certain points. So having like a IGL that you know is very very good um and then can just kind of fill in the rest of the team you know because again like crew you know they did make champs uh you know they had a, a decent year let's say overall right um so if then you can add in like a solid igl and you know what you're doing i think most people tend to like atom and the coaching staff there uh you know you fit you've obviously got kesnet or and what and um, what else as well uh so like you've got you've got potentially you know things could be looking pretty decent for crew mm -hmm. uh if they get Sadek. So that that I think would be interesting. And and personally, just like again, from like an outsider's perspective, uh, you know, I, I don't want the America's League to just become like NA good, not South you know, South America bad. Yeah. Like that that would really suck. This might suck for loud in terms of that. But there was always whispers, you'll remember there was always whispers of like, oh, Tui, you know, Sadek is is bringing up two E's and less to be these IGLs and whatever, mm -hmm. you know, so maybe, and I would suspect that's probably what's going to happen. I think one of two E's or less probably will become the IGL of loud if I had to guess. And they'll probably just bring in, you know, some other good Brazilian player probably. Yeah. Although you know, I did, I think I did see some rumors that less is like open to other options. Like he's, no, God, not, the, not that not the that full of Rome. Yeah, not that he's actually like actively exploring other options, but I think like he is entertaining leaving loud potentially. Like if if there was like a really good op offer, but it's not it's not nearly as far along as like Sodic is out type of thing. Yes, uh, and actually, you you just reminded me mm -hmm. talking about less once out. Aspas also wants out, supposedly. Yeah, supposedly also wants out of Lev. Now this is again interesting. Of Vikings is coming As back. <laughs> I think from Aspas's perspective, though, I reckon he wants to play on a Brazilian team. Really, in my opinion. Okay, I, that's what I think. I think that if I had to guess what Aspas's problems were last season, I would bet that his problems were more focused around maybe not feeling like he fit in the team as well like culture and that if he just yeah like if he just went to a north american team or whatever that that would be the same thing that he would feel like he doesn't necessarily fit in mm -hmm. and so it like this again is just pure speculation this is not you know nothing no inside info here or anything pure speculation that i would think that aspas wants to go back to a brazilian team hmm. Now, will he want to do it if the Brazilian teams, you know, can't pay more than the others? That's obviously a different question. But assuming that they could pay a salary that is, you know, equivalent to, you know, whatever lever paying him or whatever. Yeah. Um, that I think he would want to go back to a Brazilian team, which then would be interesting. What if you swapped for loud, like you just went minus Sadak <laughs> plus Aspas? <laughs> that would be uh, interesting. You know, yeah. and probably would mean that, again, they are pretty good, even if their IGLing isn't as good. 
man, Furia, MIBR, scrambling, checking the couch cushions for coins. <laughs> like, how can we get enough money to get these players over here? Yeah. Steal the show yes. from Loud, finally. Yeah. But it's there, potentially. I mean, that yeah. would be crazy if Sadek, Les, and Aspas all moved. Imagine if, like, Sadek and Les and Aspas right, came back and Sassy come back to Loud. Yeah. Fuck, oh, my God. Let's just... Let's just go crazy with the old loud roster. Yeah. You know what, Sadak? Let's just stay. Let's just bring back 2022 loud. Pancada, you're back. Sorry, <laughs> Dewey. Yeah, I Man's mean, it's all here. Crazy, crazy stuff in America is potentially happening. And I mean, that is bizarre. Like Durka on a new team, Aspas potentially on a new team. Like we're we're talking oh, like Lev some Durka to replace Aspas. Some of the biggest names in the game are moving potentially this offseason. Mm. Yeah. And then EDG just uh, just gonna be chilling. Yep. You know, no champs curse for them. Nope. Just we're fine. We're just gonna dominate the game from now on. You have fun with all your little roster moves everywhere else. There's a new king in town, and we're never letting it go. Yeah. And this game I mean, will just be dominated by China. It's possible. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Uh, anyway, let's move on to Navi. Navi, big changes we thought were coming. They're coming. Now, yep. I'm interested here because Navi are letting Sugetsu, Artis, and Zipan explore options. But this is interesting from two perspectives, right? We all expect the changes. These are three players that they're letting go, but also they're keeping, obviously, that implies they're keeping Xiao and Angel. Yep. So, my question to you then is if you were Navi and you've got these five players, how would you have organized this of who to keep and who to let go? Um, So, I think letting Sugetsu go is criminal honestly <laughs> again it's one of those players where it's like it's kind of like the Durka situation like who are you getting that's better than him in this role i mean it, it's possible that there maybe maybe there's some like you know team culture stuff potentially he's always struck me as like maybe a bit of an emotional player like he always seems to be like really pissed when they lose and maybe there's some conflicts with angel I, I don't really know. There's always like the, the Russia Ukraine stuff that you never really know what's going on there as well. Um, Navi being a, a Ukrainian org and Sugetsu obviously being a Russian player. Um, I don't really mind them letting artists and Zipan go, honestly. Like, not that these are bad players, I think they're, I think mm -hmm. they're quite good players, but I really don't think that Artis has particularly evolved as a player. I think he's kind of just like the player that he was in 2022, which was a good player, but I haven't seen sort of like the next level from him. And Zipan is kind of in the same boat. Like, in, in fact, I would say Zipan is almost kind of just like he's like flatlined as far as his, his like development and performance has gone, where he was like the Rays guy, like he was even playing Neon back in the day a bit and like yeah. had you know, some of the best KO stuff as well. And now I just feel like he's kind of like, he's a good shooter, but sometimes he doesn't perform when the moment is is big. And he has kind of just like, he's kind of just become like another flex guy that you could replace with maybe any number of, of good flex players. Um, so Sugetsu is the main one that I'm like, eh, it's a pretty big loss. Obviously, I think mm -hmm. Xiao is probably always been the best player on this team and then angel is the heart of this team for better or for worse i guess and uh yeah that's kind of what it is i'm i'm genuinely surprised that angel is still playing but you know i guess if if there's no reason for you to quit if uh if if your life is allowing you to continue doing what you love then keep at it yeah i'm i'm totally with you i was Kind of surprised at Sagetsu, uh, just because obviously we've seen an unbelievable level from him before. And I think when you see a player play at an unbelievable level, particularly on like agents that aren't, you know, uh, helping you do that, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I think when you see that, it's like, oh, it's there in you somewhere. We just yeah. got to find how to get it. And maybe, you know, obviously they're inside the building. Maybe they feel like that, that, that time is gone. Uh, but yeah, I definitely agree with you. I think. Personally, I think with the angel decision, like, again, again, are they gonna find, you know, players who are definitely better than Sagetsu or Zipan? It'll be tough. You might find one, right? You might find 
somewhat who's better, but to find three players who are definitely all going to be upgrades, that seems like a pretty big ask. Yeah. Um. You know, like this is the thing, right? There are some tier two players out there, like that were last year. Mm-hmm. You know, that will be very good. The thing is, though, as time goes on, that pool of players that is actually better than your tier one roster gets smaller and smaller. It feels like, like you know, as time goes on, the rosters, like we saw in EMEA, for instance, right? The last year's rosters on EMEA, there were so many of them that were just really bad. Yeah. Right. Come into this year, and quite a few of them have now become at least pretty decent right mm-hmm. most of them are now pretty decent so then you go forward another year it's like the pool of like oh these are actually really good players in tier two that no one bothered to pick up that gets smaller and so you know your chances of picking up someone who maybe is fine right becomes much greater i think than finding someone who's like actually going to be a massive difference maker um because that's just the way it's going to work so and personally, I think with Angel and his style of Valorant and the way he plays Valorant, like the game has kind of moved past that now. Mm-hmm. Like even your average teams in tier one now, I think are like they're they're good enough to pretty they're not gonna make stupid mistakes so that you can win four v fives all the time. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And the the level of player, like so often with the old FBX and when they were on top of the world, you know, someone is going crazy in a round. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, but now every other team has players who are as, like, you know, like every team has a, a player who's as good as Shao. Now Benji you know, Fishy like, exists and he's killing four people in a 4v1. Yeah, around. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, like the good teams like are, have better players and they don't have a player trolling yeah. you know, in half the rounds. Like, I just think the game somewhat moved on where like, you know, people don't make like, I think back to when I first started streaming. Right. And I used to get so annoyed so often in those games. Because they were often really not good. Yeah. Like, because often people were taking terrible fights Mm -hmm. and making terrible decisions. Or if you watch my stream now, like, it's been interesting doing the tier two streams because you still see it a bit more often. Um, And maybe because it's online as well, right? So, like, you know, you don't have that same kind of connection, maybe either as well. Like, it feels a bit more ranked gamey at times of like, oh, you know, people are just taking solo fights. And I'm, I'm watching these tier two games and I'm like, I don't remember feeling this that much this year, mm-hmm. right? I don't remember watching a lot of tier one games, or certainly not like the international tournaments. Certainly at the international tournaments, you didn't remember feeling like like if teams were trolling, it was like a higher level of trolling. Yeah, right. There's a, like, there's a oh, lot you're not more... thinking about opponent ults like that yeah. level trolling, but yeah, that's yeah. different to like why have you just swung out on your own? You know, into what you know is like three people. Like, what are you doing? Yeah, you know, the level of team of play is way better this year. Way yeah, better. yeah. Like, if when I'm talking about team trolling now, it's about like a higher level concept. It's not mm. about like, you know, it's like about why didn't you use your ult here? It's so obvious. Not like, oh, you just made an awful decision that just cost your team the round. Yeah. Like, whereas I feel like if that's what that, but I feel like that's just ingrained into Angel of what to do. <laughs> but I feel like that just doesn't work anymore because teams are better than that now. Anyway. That's just my opinion, but yeah, yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. Sagetsu is the is the one that's kind of weird. I think I think it is possible. Like if you look at this team, I mean, not that I think I think Sagetsu and Zipan are still like maybe even like in their early twenties. Maybe Sagetsu is like twenty three mm-hmm. now or something like that. But this was definitely the oldest team. I'm pretty sure in yeah. EMEA, so it's possible that they just really need some new younger players that are a little yeah. bit less sort of set in their ways. Maybe that'll unlock mm-hmm. Angel's ability to do crazy stuff. Um, but I, I do worry that now that Heretics has sort of like set this model of like just grab a bunch of young players, turn them into gods, that everybody's kind of going in that direction now and like maybe even foregoing some of like the experience, like buff that you get by playing at a high level for a while. And so, yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what Navi looks like in 2020. Five, yeah. it could be bad or it could be interesting. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I, I, I don't disagree with doing something like this because it's like, if you told me the team just stuck together, like, where do I think they'd finish? I don't know. Sixth? Yeah. yeah. Like, well, why are you playing for sixth? Yeah. Like, you might as well try and see if you can, you know, put something together. But it's just interesting how they've gone about it. Uh, anyway, let's move on to NRG. Now, NRG, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure we already knew that Chet was gone yep victor was gone yep but now they've added crashies to that list now one thing that surprises me and maybe hey you're in na so maybe you know how na works 
you know, how they do these kind of things. I don't know. It surprises me that why wasn't this announced with Chet and Victor? Yeah, I mean, it is possible. Because that kind of implies maybe... that, like, they thought about keeping crashies and then yeah. decided not to. Yeah, that's sort of the feeling that I get as well. I mean, it's possible that maybe his contract just, like, ended a little bit later. Mm, yeah, that's true. Um, yeah. And, but yeah, it is kind of interesting how it's like, <laughs> you know, there there was sort of rumors that it was like, well, they had to choose between Chet and Victor and Crashies or FNS and Som, and they went with Chet, Victor, and Crashies last year, and it didn't work out. And then, Vic <laughs> and then FNS and Som yeah. came back, and it's like, okay, now the reverse coup has happened potentially <laughs> like the, the last <laughs> the domino has fallen. Coup. Um, but yeah, it, it, it was interesting. Cause like if you have like paid attention to energy's like YouTube channel, you've seen that, you know, the first couple episodes of their, whatever podcast that they're doing had crashes in it. And then he hasn't been there in the last couple of ones. And so there was sort of, you know, okay, well, what does that mean? And now he is out. Um, I guess it's really not that surprising, to be honest, no. just because of like, you know, Victor being gone. These have kind of always been like a it's been like a package duo. But I think I think Crashy maybe gets a, a little bit of like misaligned hate from last year because I thought, you know, he's like mm -hmm. still a good player. Like he's he's still a good recon initiator player. He might be a little bit kind of uh, behind the curve of what it means to be like a a initiator support player at this point maybe his agent pool hasn't quite evolved as much um but i i think maybe the bigger thing is that now teams have time to step back from the grind and just look at the the field of talent in north america and be like oh <laughs> well oxygen has disbanded which means that verno is available mm -hmm. Uh, there's a lot of good talent in North America that didn't make it to Ascension. There's a lot of very, very good players. Um, Energy is a team that has money, so they kind of have their pick of the litter uh, as far as like who they want to go out and get. Um, and yeah, it could just be one of those things where they finally had enough conversations with FNS, because I assume, I would assume that FNS is doing a lot of the, the roster construction at this point. It's not chet it's not you know coaching staffs not management i would i would hope that that's in his contract <laughs> to come back to them is like i get to build the roster in 2025 um and so yeah maybe maybe he's seen somebody that he likes better and again it's one of those things kind of like the navi thing where it's like maybe it's just time to get rid of as much of the old ideas as possible except for like the the core igl idea and then go from there I think FNS was just preempting this chamber buff that's coming, and he knew he needed space for Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's got inside information with Riot for sure. Yes. Uh, no, Crashies to me was you have Demon One. He's like even better chamber yeah, yeah, than yeah. Yay. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Crashies to me was always an interesting one where I always felt like, as you were saying, like he got too much hate when he was underperforming. But yeah. I actually think the opposite was true as well that people. I think overrated him when like kind of optic were at the top and underrated him when things were going bad. I always felt like he was kind of just like much and, and not that his performance didn't change a bit, you know, mm -hmm. throughout the years, but he was just more in the middle. Uh, anyway, like, and when I say middle, I don't mean like he's an average player. He was clearly above average and clearly good. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, yeah, the, just like it, pe the people, and you know, this happens with everything, right? The people's perceptions. Either something is amazing or it's terrible, and there is yeah. no in between. Uh, it'll be interesting to see, like, with again, like players like Crashies Victor, the, you know, like you're saying, there's quite maybe a quite a bit of tier two talent out there that you could sign. Like, do they end up on a team? Like, you know, maybe not, honestly. It's... Yeah, and then what do they do, right? Like, do you try it out in tier two? Uh, it's kind of interesting. Like, I mean, I would I would think that Crash and Victor are like if they didn't, they would probably end up. They would be better than people that would be in the league if they didn't end up on a team. Cer certainly on on some of like the weaker teams, but I mean, I don't know. Like the but people might want to just be like, well, we'd rather try out someone younger. Yeah, 
who this might be good rather way than... less expensive because you got to also yeah. remember that money is a huge issue in esports right now and i would imagine that crashies and victory who have been on optic they've been on envy they've been on energy they certainly have agents they certainly have lots of connections they probably are significantly more expensive and not willing to pay, to take a pay cut or anything like that uh just because of all of their experience um so yeah i i think that they're kind of in a weird spot, right? Where it's like, you see this in sports a lot of the time, where it's like the veterans tend to be getting overpaid for what their production is. Yeah. And, but because they, you know, are tenured, they tend to kind of just like be able to get that rate for a long time. Yeah. Um, but when they do finally get, you know, left off of a team, it's very hard for them to find another team without mm. taking a significant either role reduction or pay pay cut or whatever so yeah uh, it definitely is is a rough spot for for crashes and victor as far as like finding a new team i think um and yeah going into tier two yuck <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes um and then finally for the changes that we're going to talk about it's everyone's favorite team elevate certainly his favorite team it's team liquid uh, now you have always been a Team Liquid hater, uh, so it's not I, true. I, it's not true. <laughs> let's get your initial reaction. What Team Liquid have decided to do is remove Enzo. Oh, I say remove, as res uh, let them explore. It's such a nice way of putting it, isn't it. We want them to explore other options. Yeah, it's as restricted free agents. It's please, please find another team. Do all of the legwork for us to get rid of you. And yes. But we still are going to try and pay. Yeah, like, we're trying get to get to as much you. money <laughs> yeah. from you as we can. Yeah. Uh, but that's to Enzo, Mystic, and Yampi, and they are keeping Nets and Kiko. Now, yeah. what is your reaction to that? Um, I mean, it makes sense. Uh, the thing is, is just like if you're liquid, you're an org that wins championships. And if you're not even making champs, if you're not making a single international event, uh you got to do something different um and as far as the players i think you know it's it's been very unfortunate to watch nats's career trajectory since leaving gambit mm. honestly um it feels a little bit like he's kind of squandered his talent at liquid to some extent um not really necessarily because of his own doing i okay <laughs> let me put it this way I was a massive Liquid fan in Dota 2. I was excited for them in Valorant. But I've thought that the way that the team has been built and run in Valorant specifically has made me irrationally angry. And that's why I've become <laughs> a Liquid hater. I'm not actually a Liquid hater, but I do not like the roster moves that they've made. I don't like how they've built their teams basically at any point in, in the team's history. Uh, I kind of like the Scream Nevera duo, you know, for better or for worse. Uh, but I didn't like this roster. I did not think they were going to be good, and they weren't. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think that all three players who are being removed probably deserve to be removed. Like, that, that's, that might sound harsh, but uh, I, you know, I thought Mystic played relatively well this year. Um, I don't think Enzo is very good, and Yampi has just kind of always been a player with no real identity, I think. Like, he's played a trillion different roles. He's always been solid, but he's never really kind of, like, I guess, realized the potential of, like, the young superstar from Finland that he was uh, in, in Counter-Strike in early days of, of Valorant. Um, and there's a absolute fuck ton of good talent in emea that is not getting paid anything in tier two and so liquid has a lot of options out there um and like many other teams while they probably are experiencing some you know esports winner some some economic issues they are certainly one of the better teams to pay people um and everybody wants to go to liquid in in europe like that is the organization that you want to play for in Europe, aside from Fnatic, probably. Um, I've also heard rumors that they are making coaching moves as well. So I know that mm. they, have, I know that they are trialing coaches. So it could be an even bigger shakeup. Um, I don't really know who will go there, uh, but yeah, this team definitely needed to make moves. 
and building around Nats makes a lot of sense. Um, Kiko was quite good at times, quite inexperienced looking at other times. I was definitely a little bit of like, he looks like a tier two duelist playing a tier one team, um, but he's obviously a good player. Like he, ha he has talent and if they can develop him correctly, I think he could be really, really good. Um, not necessarily as a duelist. We might see him on another role next year, uh, but we'll see. What are your thoughts? I was a little surprised they kept Kiko. I mean, again, with the three players they changed, as you say, Mystic and Enzo. Mm, yeah. You can you say know. it. They're they're not tier one players. Feels harsh though to say that, but Is maybe it? in the modern day. <laughs> are are facts harsh? <laughs> I'm calling a fact is harsh in and of itself. But Yampi, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yampi's biggest problem is that he just he, he 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 probably needed in the past to be more selfish and say, no, I'm not going to play fucking four different roles on this team to yeah. suit everyone else. He just needs to say, no, fuck off. I'm going to play this um, and get good at it. Because I do think that that is, is a problem. That, as you say, what is Yampi's identity as a player? I still don't know. Like yeah. he, He's good. He's good with an op. And he's a pretty good fragger. Yeah. But okay. he's been playing like <laughs> more and more supportive roles. It feels like every single yes. year. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. That just that just always felt almost harsh on Yampi in a way. Yeah. Um. And then, yeah, I am a little surprised that they kept Kiko because I do. I mean, as you said, like maybe he can transform into another role and and be good at that. But you know, that's a wait and see, I guess. Uh, and I don't think like if they would have cut Kiko, I would have been like, yeah, that that makes some sense as well. Like he was okay. And it's interesting you're saying, like, build around Nats and all of that. Because a part of me is thinking, well, last year, you had a chance to rebuild the team. Yeah. And you had one of the best players in the MEA, and you got rid of him. Why did you do that? It didn't make any sense at the time. It makes less sense looking Wait, back on player? it now. Safe. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. I forgot that he was there last year. Yeah, they had safe. They let him go. It didn't make any sense. Um, and now you can and, understand why I've devolved from being a liquid fan into <laughs> it didn't make any sense like again when you have good players like you, you have to find ways of keeping good players yeah. um, and that's obviously that uh, assuming they're going to keep Nats and the thing is though Nats I feel like I, he's, I think him being on liquid might be giving him a bit of a pass the people think that liquid are inept and therefore you know, it's on Liquid rather than on Nats. Ooh, the Nats hate from TMV. I'm just going to point out, I'm just going to point out, I don't think Nats is bad. I, I'm i not saying like Nats, you know, deserves to get cut. I'm not saying he's bad, but I think we all keep in our mind the, you know, early days Nats where he's dominating the game and it's like having the best performances ever. Yeah. Right? In my opinion... He's not going to go to an international tournament and be the best player again, ever. Okay. That's not going to happen, in my opinion. Maybe you do think that's going to happen. I personally think, I, I don't think it's going to happen. It personally. seems like maybe this year would have been a year for a big resurgence from him with so much chamber, or so much sniper being played. Yes. Um, uh, also, quick aside, I can't He's remember fine. where I saw this. It was some, some very experienced player. It might have been the Energy Podcast. I can't remember. Um, but some very experienced player that you would think would know this, they were talking mm -hmm. about playing against Nats back when like the yeah. swoop peak was a thing with the Viper stuff. Yeah. They didn't know that was a mechanic. They were playing at an international tournament and they didn't know that swoop peaking exist, existed. And they were like surprised at how Nats was just instantly killing them out of the Viper orb. How the fuck did they not know that that was a mechanic? That was all over YouTube. It was all over internet. I mean, the internet. I, I, I probably as a what, like, uh, as someone who played a lot of Viper, yeah. like, y in your gold lobbies. Yeah, people were the gold speaking. lobby players knew that. Yeah, they were at an international land and they didn't know what was happening. Why he was killing them instantly out of Viper Orb. Is that is that fucking crazy to you? That is that is bizarre. That is that is kind of crazy. Yeah. But anyway, that goes to my point. Maybe without it, you know, he's just not the same player. He was just a <laughs> viper he's merchant. People who have got no idea what's going on. Viper you know? merchant. 
but yeah, I, I think like Nats is like good. But I think like if in my opinion, the days of Nats being an elite player, I'm gonna need to see it again sometime soon because it's been TikTok two two years now. TikTok. <laughs> That's a long time in this game to, you know, true be a decent player and me to still think like, oh, you have to keep Nats. All right. Just my opinion. And look, we look, I liked fake Nats and fake Nats is friends with Nats. So, you know. I like Nats. Of course I like Nats. Who couldn't like Nats? Yeah. The, pri- need the, to see the prism. Him. And look, phantom. he is on liquid, don't get me wrong. This team trolls all the time. They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> Like, let's be real. There is some leeway there that I'm willing to give him. But, you know, third year of this now? I mean, come on. We got to yeah, it's we fair. gotta see something. It's fair. Okay. Shall we move on? Let's, let's move, move on. on to uh, changes that were announced today. Hot off the press. Breaking news. Breaking news. Astra and Chamber are getting buffed. Oh, my God. And they're not even little small buffs that don't make a difference. Yep. They're real. They're real buffs that will make a tangible difference to both agents. Yep. Even though they're just, I'm pretty sure it's just one change for each of them, right? So Chamber, let's start with Chamber. His teleport radius is going from a whole 13 meters, which is what it is now, Yep. to a whole 18 meters. Yep. Wow. Okay. Explain so, why this is a big deal. Okay, so the biggest reason that this is a, a big deal is that circles exist. And the way that circles... Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. You lost me. <laughs> the way that circles exist <laughs> is that when you change the radius of a circle, the area of the circle actually improves. Okay, I, I'm going to shut the fuck up with math. We're just going to go to Valoplant. So I pulled up Valoplant. Oh. And I have put up two circles. The first circle... Whoa. Is, is Chamber's current teleport radius, which is 13 meters. Okay? More. Now, I've overlaid that circle with Sky's regrowth circle, which is 18 meters. So the, the, oh, is the, that how you do it? Oh, yeah. sugar. So the, the new that. radius of Chamber's teleport is represented by the green circle. So you can see how much extra oh. area you're able to play as Chamber. Oh! Now, why this might matter is we're also returning to maps like Pearl, where Chamber was historically dominant. And if you overlay the regrowth circle and the current rendezvous, you can see that we get a lot more interesting spots that we could potentially play as Chamber. If we go to Split, which is also coming back, another map where Chamber can be very, very dangerous, and we put the regrowth circle in common spots where Chamber might like to play. And we see the overwhelming number of new options where a Chamber can play. This is actually pretty significant. And now, one thing I will say is that I think 2024 was the year in which op players were the most fucked. <laughs> and the reason for that <laughs> is because you had to shoot Fade stuff, you had to shoot Gecko stuff, you had to shoot Sova stuff. There was l- lots of comps were playing Double Flash plus stuff that you had to shoot because Gecko became a massive part of the meta. Um, there was Yoru s- still, yeah, Yoru. There was still a lot of, I mean, Yoru Dimensional Drift versus an op, it's, it's over. <laughs> like, your life <laughs> is over. Um, there was double smokes being played on a lot of comps as well still. And teams have just gotten a lot better and not getting owned by Jet. And Jet's main value proposition in professional play is playing very stupidly, but being able to get away with it, right? I, I am the biggest Jet hater in the game at this point, where I think that the only way to truly capitalize on Jet's abilities is to play bad valorant but get away with it because you're able to just walk through smokes randomly and escape now chamber has something that no other agent has which is instantaneous repositioning no other agent can do this and we saw how powerful that was when chamber was broken because when you can take a completely unplayable angle 
with an operator and still survive, it is a very big deal. <laughs> so mm -hmm. now that number of angles has massively increased. Um, so I'm 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 really interested. I'm I'm really interested to see whether the the new meta of the initiators and all that stuff is enough to kind of keep chamber in check, or whether we're going to see a lot more chamber value in 2025. Um, I'm personally most excited about the Astra change because as somebody who's liked playing Astra and, and enjoyed how creative and interesting Astra can be, um, uh, it's been kind of unfortunate to see her kind of really fall to second fiddle to Omen and basically every other agent in the game. Um, but again, with Pearl returning with split returning, with well, let, let me, let me get into, we'll get into Astra in a second. Let, no, 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 okay, go ahead. <laughs> let's take on Chamber for a second. So yeah, this don't let anyone tell you that this is only a small buff. Yeah. Okay. I will not accept that this is a small buff, and the re and I I can almost prove it to you to be honest, which is go back in your mind, remember what the initial chamber looked like, mm -hmm. remember how many times Riot tried to nerf that agent. Right. Remember all the little things that they changed. They changed. You know, he had two traps at first. They changed that to one. They made it range restricted. He had the headhunter bullets that cost less. They now actually cost the same as they did initially, but they nerfed that as well. Yep. Right. The ult got big nerfs. Right. Again, they have slightly reverted some of that, but it's not quite back to its initial form. They tried all these little nerfs. They were they're desperately trying to nerf everything but the rendezvous. And then finally, they were like, fine, we have to nerf the rendezvous. And they yep. did. And Chamber disappeared. Yep. This, let me tell you, this is like if chamber viability option, this is the main thing that matters. Yeah. Okay. This is like the main thing. I'm sure there are some characters in League of Legends or Dota or whatever, some of these hero games, right? Where basically they just have one ability that kind of really matters, yeah. right? Yep. This chamber is that in this game. He has one ability that really, really matters, and it's the rendezvous. So buffing it in any way. And I mean, as you say, you can go on to now multiple maps and just the threat of being on like. I could literally be fucking anywhere. Because that's the thing. With the current rendezvous, or the old one, there were certain parts of certain maps where, like, I'm looking at Abyss, right? Yeah. I'm looking at Abyss B-site. You couldn't put down a good rendezvous on Abyss B-site. Yeah, not Now, really. go and put a rendezvous on, like, you know, towards, like, the little bookcase stuff deep mm. on the site. So you're in a very safe position. You can walk all the way down B, right? Yeah. You can walk all the way and get pushed even further than that, you know, deep into B main. Right, you can That's actually a big deal. You can actually play on the spot that the Jets like to play, like Buzz was playing. Yeah, you can play on the Buzz spot and, and still TV escape to the bookcase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like little things like that. That makes so much of a difference for Chambers' viability on a map. Yeah, the fact that now we have a super safe place of putting a TP that is a massive threat in multiple positions, like it just changes everything about the agent in terms of its viability. Because again, Chamber, even in the old days, Chamber wasn't giving you that much on attack. Right, right? he was basically just a trip. On attack. That's all it was. Yep. But that doesn't matter if the defensive capabilities are so strong. And as you say, it's going to be interesting to see. Because obviously teams have got a lot better, right, mm -hmm. in terms of dealing with shit. So teams are better now, at, you know, figuring this kind of stuff out. So it'll be interesting to see. But even, even in this past season, we saw some Chamber performances where Chamber took over the game. And I think particularly if you're playing against, like, you know, not the very top teams, Mm -hmm. you'll probably be able to find quite a bit of value from just sticking in a chamber every so often. And, you know, if you've got someone who is good with an op and whatnot, Cryo you'll probably be able to find value buff. from it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, if you do have that player, someone who's good in the chamber meta, I think that's going to be big for you. Uh, will it become buff? the meta? Will it become, like, the meta? In my opinion, no. No. But will it become, like, a viable option? Maybe even meta on a map or two? Yeah. I could see that, right? I, I could see, I could see that. I'm looking at some of the Lotus stuff. You know how people used to like put the trip, and the, or put the rendezvous, then open the door and then take rubble. But you could like barely yeah. take rubble. You can fully get on the line now and still teleport back to tree, with the new range. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, chamber I think, gonna be a a, a pretty decent option. Which is cool uh, because say. right now the only sentinels that matter are the ones that can hold large swaths of the map with info. And if you give Chamber the ability to actually lock down an entire lane with the operator and still have his trademark holding another part of the map, that's a lot of control. So yeah, very interesting. Yeah. 
And now let's move on to Astra then. So the Astra buff, very, very simple, yet very, very important. Yes. And that is Astra's stars have gone from four to five. Again, this is a massive change. This is a change that a lot of people, lots of people, <laughs> were, you know, <laughs> talking about having this uh, being a change that they wanted to see. And Many Riot people are it. saying that 45 yeah, stars will make her people, broken again. <laughs> the best people want Astra to have five stars again. Uh, and now Astra does. Now, I personally made a video a couple of days ago about why I didn't want Astra to get a fifth star back. Mm -hmm. And let me explain why I made that argument. My argument was just basically that people are now good at the game, whereas <laughs> they weren't when Astra had five stars before. Sure. So people will find ways of using Astra in interest, you know, like, you know, optimizing recall stars all the time, you know, like playing efficiently with your stars and stuff like that. And basically, the fifth star allows you to have a big impact in every round because you have basically a free star, right? Yep. You can always have that free star in your back pocket. So no matter where your opponent goes, no matter what they do, I've got a star to what to counter something, whatever you want to do, right? Mm -hmm. I can have an impact if I'm a good Astro player. And I just thought that that would be, you know, maybe not the best idea. And I... I suggest, you know, keeping four stars, but basically buffing everything else, right? Like, don't give a fifth star, but just, you know, buff the cooldowns, buff the recall stars, you know, buff, yeah. buff like all the other elements of Astra, but not a fifth star. Um, but they have gone with the fifth star. I guess it's just probably simpler and easier and people will like it. Mm -hmm. But now, and I'm interested to see what you think. If If I was a team now, and I'm building around this meta. And obviously, we don't know if, I mean, maybe more changes are coming down the line, but let's say that they don't. Let's say this is it. Right, and this is what we start the next year's meta with. I would be playing Astra Omen mm. all the time. Like yeah. I, my Omen pick rate is not going down because Omen is fucking good. Mm -hmm. But my Astra pick rate is going up because I think Astra now is gonna be really good. And I think that Astra and Omen together, and we have already you know, we saw a bit of experimentation with that, you know, this past season. EDG played it on Lotus. We saw Kami Cole playing it earlier in the season, uh, to some success as well. Mm -hmm. But now I think if you really get creative with this and fuck it, throw in a Yoru in there as well, right? Because mm -hmm. now I can fucking, I can use one of their smokes to have Yoru TP into and to have Omen TP into it afterwards, right? And it's free because I've got other smokes anyway. Mm -hmm. Like I I would be cooking up with this stuff, <laughs> right? And you know what? Viper's still good as well. Fuck it. FPX this shit. We're playing three controllers. Yeah, Fuck I would it. just play Viper Viper Astra as your Sentinels, basically. Omen's now yeah. like a pseudo duelist initiator. Yeah, you got smokes on three of your players. It's pretty yeah, good. Yeah, I'm playing Astra, Omen, Viper, Yoru, Fade, and I'm fucking you. Yeah. But that would be exciting to me. But let me let me hear your take. What do you think of Astra Five Stars? Um. Yeah. I mean, it's it's just good. Like I I think that. I was sort of on the on board with you keeping it at four, but you know making the recall star back to like fifteen seconds or or lower or something like that instead of twenty five. Is it was it is it twenty five now? No, I think it's. Is it fifteen? I can't remember. Is it fifteen now? I think. Yeah, maybe maybe that's what it is. But anyway, it's too long to be really really flexible to to yeah. recall stars. So I I would prefer to just be able to recall stars at a much more rapid rate because I think that gives you a lot more like creative options just to you know cross mm -hmm. small little areas and not lose a star for a long period of time yeah. but i guess now you just have a, a star to do that with so you just have like a dedicated recall star now basically yeah, essentially and um yeah that's i guess that's fine um yeah i mean i've i've been hammering away at astra is a good agent people should be playing more astra she's very very good as is now she got better cool um I will be interested to see how uh, the meta looks because, I mean, if we're bringing back Chamber, Viper is still viable. We have Astra. We have this new interesting Sentinel, which I want to talk about briefly before we move on to the rest of the episode, okay. which yeah, is sure. Vice. Um, I mean, are we going into Swamp meta again? <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it potentially going back to you must default, disarm all of the traps, otherwise you get annihilated on the execute? It's possible. I mean, we, we could be going to a much slower meta next year, which would be very interesting because I feel like a lot of teams have like fully bought into just the, the send it meta. <laughs> yeah. And so 
uh, whoever really comes up with the way to can't uh, to counter the send it meta might be in for a, a hot start to 2025 yeah yeah um i i think it's going to be be interesting i mean as i said like i is this the I death don't... of breach finally <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yes finally yeah could breaches win rate go any lower now that we've got three very viable controller options across all these maps like fuck me um uh i think it's going to be very interesting i think like the controller meta now will be interesting i will say one thing you cannot leave harbor in this state <laughs> with this buff you simply must and you must buff harbor in some kind of way if astra is getting a fifth star and omen is crazy good and viper is good you know and, and clove is like a ranked agent and brim will be good on bind still uh and fracture like he still will be fine on those maps but yeah. harbor my boy he must be buffed in some way. He <laughs> must simply must be. Otherwise, he is just gonna kind of literal zero percent pick rate. I can't think of one one map, one reason you would pick Harbor over an Astro or an Omen at this point. Yeah, I think that's pretty pretty fair. I mean, reckoning is a good ability, and his, yeah, his, yeah, his like, wall he's is, not, is flexible, I, but yeah, yeah, he's not bad. Yeah. But you can't have the rest of the control class be really good and him be bad. But I think that this is interesting because. Like, I've always thought, and I think most people have probably thought, like, the Initiator class, on average, just felt a bit better than the rest of them. Mm -hmm. uh, just in terms of how the classes work and what the abilities do. For the most part, I feel like the Initiators have just always been slightly better. But now, I think you're looking at it and being like, okay, well, in the Sentinel class, Killjoy, Cypher, Chamber, and maybe Vice now, are all viable Sentinels, you know, that you could play and no one thinks that you're trolling. Um, and maybe even with Vice, you know, you could pair it with one of the others and, and feel mm -hmm. like, you know, we're playing double Sentinel and that's fine. So you've got four, I would say, legitimately decent options uh, in, in the Sentinel class. The Initiated class, as I said, was good. And now you're getting a controller class that I think you're looking at definitely three options on every map and being like, this is a potentially pretty good pick. Mm -hmm. So, And the Duelist class has that... also gotten significant buffs in the last year where a lot of stuff is viable. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Yeah, we are getting to, and yeah, as you say, the duelists as well. Now, there's still maybe some things they could fix with the duelist class, and there's still, you know, like Sage and Deadlock, for instance, in the Sentinel class. But we, I think that we're getting to the point, and as I said, like if they buffed Harbor as well, and maybe if they, you know, buffed a Phoenix and buffed a, you know, a, a, a Sage or a Deadlock a bit as well, like you would end up in this kind of like, we're ending up, I think, in a good space where you feel like, there's so many good options, right? That's what you want for like a game balance of a game, I think. You want everyone to feel like nothing is like I I mean, you know, I, I would still argue that Omen is a bit too strong and <laughs> and I personally think Viper's a bit too strong, but that's just me. Mm -hmm. Most people don't, I think, at this point. But you're ending in a situation where no one really feels like anything is like crazy, like off the level broken. But I'm excited to like, you know, see what people can do with a variety of options right mm -hmm. you want to play neon with astra and shit i'm excited right yeah. you want to play omen with with rays cool right like there's there's going to be a lot of interesting things that that i think we'll see and i'm i'm excited i'm excited mr speaks yeah also i mean i gotta say like just to cap off this agent discussion oh actually i guess we're gonna talk about vice here in a sec but yeah what the fuck happened to iso like he got buffed. <laughs> Everybody was like, "This is the craziest thing they could have possibly done to this character and and this game." Then they made it so the shield didn't last quite as long, and you couldn't refresh it an infinite number of times, basically. <laughs> but you still had a shield on demand that you could refresh many times, and basically have like for the entire round if you were fragging. And everybody's just like, "Nah, he's bad." Like what? Yeah. This, like how did how did Iso go from being this... the the most broken character in the game <laughs> yeah. to being basically unplayed at champions aside from Fnatic with a a change that basically did nothing to the agent? I don't get it. Yeah, this I think is I I think you're seeing there the psychological impact that just changing an agent can have um which is why i want to say like the two buffs that we've just yeah. spoken about like to me they are not psychological they yeah. are real yeah. they really do matter i'm telling you right, right now learn iso because everybody's going to be playing fucking chamber 
and ISO is the oh, best chamber ISO counter in the game. Oh, ISO the chamber. Let's he's, go. He's Mr. unbelievably Spence. good against chamber. So. Oh, you're cooking. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Uh, that's definitely true. Um, and the great thing about ISO is you don't really need to learn to play ISO. Right. You just press a button. You just have and you're to learn invincible. to press E. <laughs> <laughs> so can you press E? You can play ISO. Correct. Congratulations. Um, but yeah, definitely, definitely interesting. Definitely somewhat excited to see what they do. I really, really, really pray and hope, like, if we could get, you know, a Phoenix. It's interesting with CGN playing so much Phoenix. It's kind of, you know, been in the forefront i think yeah uh of my recent discussions with my twitch chat and whatever of like how would you buff phoenix you know uh but i would love if we could get uh you know something there some love for some of these uh, more forgotten agents yeah. like harbor as well uh but yeah i'm excited i'm excited for the minute let's talk about vice then what, yeah. what i've obviously kind of given my vice takes before it even really came out uh that i thought vice would be pretty good yeah, not crazy. This to me was, I think I said the first like good balanced agent that they made in like a long, long time mm -hmm. uh, upon release. Was I wrong? Um, I think you might be slightly underrating her. I think she has okay. potential to be really good, like okay, like meta changing good. Um, okay, tell me why. Arc Rose is a fucking crazy ability. <laughs> it is so good. So Arc Rose, for those who don't know the names, which I don't blame you is her signature it's the flash that functions like a cypher camera when you place it with the left click and functions like a breach flash when you place it with the right click um it also functions like a sky flash in terms of giving you information when you flash people mm -hmm. and uh you can okay so i have spent probably over 100 hours on vice since she came out uh playing be grinding i've been grinding vice i've been spending a lot of time in server looking for stuff uh let me just tell you the ability to like quote unquote i call it drilling through wall with with the flash like like breaches flash yeah you can put it in some insane places on a lot of maps where you're just like oh you can just get information like almost in their spawn that's kind of broken okay so yeah you can the the amount of information that she gives you is potentially enough to replace an initiator on a team and then you Ooh. still have the stalling power of the best sentinels in the game like the the power of sheer plus the the razor vines cannot be underestimated to stop an attack like it yes. really is as good as a cypher cage one way plus trip plus camera setup it's as good as killjoy's like microwave setup um she's very good at stalling on the attack or she's very good at stalling on the defense and she is way better than most sentinels on the attack way better than most sentinels on the attack so i think yeah. i think she's very powerful um i mean i'm very interested to see what the meta looks like next year in the sentinel class because like you said I mean, Chamber is fully viable now, in my opinion. Vice mm -hmm. is very, very good. Cypher and Killjoy did not get changed, and they are both extremely good. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited as well. TMV. <laughs> I, I just, I just hope that teams, teams, you know, be creative, please. That's all I'm asking. Yeah, be, I mean, this, be is, creative this is your and, time. And learn to play the fucking agents <laughs> don't don't just see some <laughs> random team playing this thing be like yeah let's just pop it in this this player who's never played it in ranked is gonna play it in an official that doesn't work you, you must learn the mechanics of your agents if you're gonna play them yeah i i think i mean i mean look my main two things about what makes an agent good vice fulfills both criteria information yeah. and stopping power yeah like uh, like has that does that pretty well you're probably going to be pretty good um the reason i kind of toned down my kind of because initially when i saw vice and like learned that that's what the flash did because remember like there was the initial kind of like little leaks that came out that were like oh she's she's got a flash mm -hmm. i was like oh okay cool i guess and then it was like oh but actually it gives you information and the cooldown time isn't it's much less than you expect it was like oh shit yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh that's 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 a lot better than i thought yeah what I think calmed me down was just having used it in like a, a bit of testing myself. 
I did think like mm, the the razor vines I found a bit clunky. Yeah, uh, they're not at the times. Best. Yeah, and I do like th this is the thing that I didn't know at the time, and and I haven't put in the hours like you have, so I didn't know. But I was thinking when I was doing the play testing, like I'm sure there are some like breach flash s locations that are going to be super strong. But I just don't know where they are, and I can't be bothered to find them. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to bother. Uh, but you have put in the time to do that. So that was always the thing for me of like, them. There probably will be some good spots, but that will probably determine like how viable is this agent on attack, like how many good flash spots that people aren't going to be able to destroy straight away. You know, can you get to? Yeah, I'll um, send. But... I'll send you a document after the podcast. Okay. 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 Well, uh, well then I'll just be maining vice in my games and using little <laughs> elevated setups. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, but yeah, I agree with you that vice will be good. And as I said, like you've now got like four, four good sentinels. And as you say, maybe you can. The interesting thing about vice, of course, will be, as you said, like you can maybe get away with not playing any other sentinel with vice on mm -hmm. some maps. And you definitely, well, you definitely can on some maps, but yep. you, you can maybe on other maps as well. Uh, but then also, as you said, like maybe you still want to play double sentinel because vice, you know, like I, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, vice, the com some of the combos you could do with killjoy are yep. one really funny yeah. and two going to be extremely good. Yep. Uh, but also maybe if you're thinking about not playing an initiator or, you know, you would add in a cipher and then between cipher and vice, you know, you've maybe got enough information and flash there to, you know, to where it's okay, right? To where you're not, you're, you still have that kind of core of the team, you know, particularly if you're playing like, you know, a raise as well. So you have a boom bot as well, right? Like, yeah, add in all these little things and it kind of adds up to enough, right? right? Her, to where her you're flexibility not. almost allows you to play like a double slash almost triple initiator comp without sacrificing the sentinel role. Or you yeah. can play a double sentinel plus double initiator comp, kind of. Or you can play, you know, a traditional comp, but still kind of have Vice filling the role of initiator and sentinel at the same time. Um, so you can, you can, you know, play like a duelist plus double smokes plus quote unquote double initiator. And like, yeah, that's yeah. it's good. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely uh, will be. So that's, that's, I think, agent talk, Yep. Um, which is always fun talking about the agents in this game and and really that discussion has just made me even more kind of ready for next next season and what and what yeah. will happen uh but we we shall see although i w it's kind of a weird situation because now if they like like if they heavily nerfed omen now i kind of be just like oh now it's just gonna be astro yeah an astro viper on some maps oh that's dull <laughs> yeah so i don't know i don't even know what i want anymore don't anyway touch omen. Uh, leave, leave omen as is everything's fine Let's talk about Ascension, because there is still games going on. As I said at the top of this podcast, I'm still working a lot. <laughs> um, and that's because of Ascension. It's been Ascension EMEA up until now, but starting as we record today, yep. America's Ascension also begins. Uh, so let's start talking about EMEA, though. So uh, we've gone through the group stage in the Ascension EMEA. We are now into the playoffs. We're now actually into the final three, which we played uh, next weekend. Uh, with CGN Pacific and Apex are already through to the grand final. So CGN Pacific, lower final, Apex in the grand. I don't know how much of it you have watched, uh, but if you have watched any of it elevated, what have you thought? Yeah, so I haven't watched a ton of it. I've struggled to find myself being interested in it, unfortunately. Like, I don't know whether I'm just like kind of burned out from all mm. the champ stuff, plus also coaching Ascend and maybe there's a little bit of resentment that i'm not here at this ascension <laughs> i don't know but I, I haven't watched a ton of it i've I've peeked at some of the games i've seen a little bit from each of the teams that is still in it but i i actually don't think i've watched an entire series so you'll have to kind of leave okay. the most of this but i will say just quickly going over the group stage um not that surprised by how things went except for the utter collapse of go next because they looked like they mm -hmm. were primed to make it through and then they just played yep. two of the worst fucking series like ever <laughs> potentially yep. that they've ever played um mm -hmm. i don't really know a lot about pacific or the ultimates i do know that pacific came through premier um and as yeah. we've seen in some other regions the premier teams that have been grinding premier and just you know working 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 uh, have been really impressive overall. Mm -hmm. um, we, as Ascend, didn't scrim a t 
a ton of these teams. I think like we were trying to not scrim teams that we thought would be at yeah. Ascension. Um, we did play most of them like once or twice while I was there, but not too much. So I don't have the best sense. Um, to me, I guess I'll just say this and then I'll let you kind of like expand on everything. To me, I'm fairly confident that this is Apex's tournament to lose. I mean, it, obviously it makes sense it, th them already being in the grand final, but obviously even coming into the playoffs, it's kind of their tournament to lose just because they have much more experience than any of the other teams as far as like the, the players on the team with Solkas and Avova and um, I mean, even like Hype and Molzy have been there before. Um, so they kind of have like the pedigree of players. I think so far what we've seen, they just look like more experienced players. They look like a more experienced team. Um, you know, CGN and Pacific have their own sort of like unique idiosyncrasies, but they're definitely much less polished. CGN is kind of like riding their their weird stuff, <laughs> their Phoenix every map, that type of thing. <laughs> and Pacific is just kind of like a standard Turkish team, which is like they're really, really cracked. Sometimes they pop off. Sometimes it's enough to carry them through, but against more disciplined teams they kind of fall apart under the pressure so it seems like this is kind of just apex should be making it through and, and moving on which is you know good for them good for the org um i was talking shit about their social media presence the other day but i don't dislike <laughs> this team and i don't i don't have any animosity towards the players of the org um so you know good for them if they make it through yeah i'll i'll run through what i saw mm -hmm. uh <laughs> so Get it. Uh, uh, although I do need to sneeze. A sneeze is going on. So if I sneeze halfway through this, you'll know why. Um, although you, you. would have you would have already assumed why. It's that I needed to sneeze. Uh, right. Yeah. So the group stages, as you correctly pointed out, go next esports absolutely cr crumbled. They actually beat Apex in their first game. Mm -hmm. For those of you who didn't watch it. Uh, so Elevated is rightly talking about Apex probably being the favorite. Well, go next beat them in their first game and looked like the better team. Uh, then they won their second game as well. And then they played CGN, who are now in the lower finals, who, as Elevate pointed out, play a lot of Phoenix and stuff. I play a lot of weird comps. And I am convinced, convinced that Go Next, from the start of that game, they lost the second round of the game. And I'm convinced from that point on, they were mega tilted. Mm -hmm. And they played like they were mega tilted. They won Not just for that game. lost the anti eco. And then that was yes. it, basically is what you're saying. Y yes, they then lost. They then lost, as I made a video on this as well, they then lost five, after winning five pistols across <laughs> the next two games, they lost five second rounds in a row, which yeah. is almost statistically, it's never going to happen. You're probably not going to ever see that again for yeah. as long as you follow Valorant. Um, and I just thought that they were tilted. I, I really did. And, and the thing is that makes me think that even more is that they kept winning these pistol rounds, which I guess are probably set rounds where they knew what they were going to do no matter what. Right? Like, this is the round we're going to do. And they would win those rounds. And then they would just keep losing these second rounds. And I'm, and they just were making decisions that they weren't in the first couple of games. Mm -hmm. The first couple of games, they looked really drilled. They looked really coordinated and kind of, you know, taking good fights together. After that, it, it didn't look like that. There was a lot of like, I'm just going to solo beat this because I'm tilted. Is what I thought happened to them, to be honest. It, it didn't look very good at all. And they ended up losing. Uh, there was a bit of controversy as well. I don't know if you saw this uh, with the other group with Job Life. Uh, job Life, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so Job Life, the French team, ended up not making the playoffs by one round. Mm -hmm. They had the same record, the same map differential. Oh, I didn't even realize and they it was had a plus. Breakers, yeah, they had a plus four round differential, but the Ultimates had a plus five oh, round differential. So it came down to one round. Uh, and the thing is, in Job Life's last game. Uh, against Mao's Esports, where again, they only needed like a couple rounds to go through. Uh, they lost the game, but again, had they just won a couple of rounds and they lost the last, what is it, nine rounds in a row because one of their players, their duelist, kept, yes, kept disconnecting throughout the game. Yeah. So there was a bunch of tech pauses and stuff because their duelist player was just dis DCing throughout. And there was a bit of controversy because Job Life said, hey, can we, you know, can we have a, our sub instead? Can can they play instead of our, our guy who's disconnecting all the time? Uh, and the ref said no, even though apparently according to the rules, people say like, oh, they maybe should have allowed them to do that. Um, and also it's just kind of common sense. And I always think like, whatever your rules are, like just use your common sense. Like, you know, 
and right. and then, but, and then they, they released a statement that was like because he didn't fully disconnect and not come back yeah like they, they couldn't that, do that's it. the reason yeah. that you couldn't use the sub but it's like uh obviously he's gonna try and come back because he thinks that he has to yeah yeah <laughs> and obviously you're gonna try yeah. like obviously you're not just gonna sit there and be like oh unlucky i guess right uh, now job life did bring this upon themselves somewhat as well because they chose to play from their own homes mm -hmm. which had they not have done you know this wouldn't have happened anyway personally i don't job life i don't think we're gonna win anyway so it is a bit of a obviously a bit of a what if and a mm. bit of a shame but i think there are better teams now you're saying that apex will win this tournament or should feel like they're going to win this tournament i would put one caveat on that mm -hmm. in the pacific who haven't played apex in this tournament they've avoided each other because pacific lost to cgn but again i feel like cgn their main strength is that they tilt their opponent mm -hmm. <laughs> by playing phoenix and beating people with phoenix mm -hmm. but i think the pacific have shown that overall highest level. If you what I remember watching the first map of Pacific versus CGN, particularly the first half, I remember looking at that first half and being like, oh, this doesn't even look like a tier one team. This looks like a good tier one team. Hmm. Like they had some rounds in there, some retakes, 5v5 retakes that you were like, wow, like that looks really good. Like all the utility, every swing is with two people, like high lows everywhere. Like it was, it was crazy good. Mm -hmm. Um and I was like, wow. So the only thing I would say is, yeah, Apex will be favorite because they have a double map ban as well. Mm -hmm. But if Pacific can beat CGN, because Pacific, and the thing about Pacific is they're a very young team. If Pacific make it, they've got three players who can't play because they're too young in tier one. So they're going to yeah. need a new team if they do make it <laughs> anyway, which would be obviously a bit of a shame. But Yeah, pretty weird situation. Yeah, a very strange situation. But... I just hope it's Apex just because of that. Then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is true, yes. Also, they're called Pacific. And so if we have Pacific and EMEA, <laughs> it's going to be fucking chaos. Um, but yeah, if they do play at their very best, though, Pacific, I think that they they can. They I, I think they have the highest ceiling of any team. It's mm -hmm. just that they aren't always going to reach that level because they're a very young, inexperienced team. Um, but they are, as you say, incre incredibly good aimers and also have like like when they're on their fundamentals are also really good mm -hmm. and so they're very hard to beat um but yeah apex probably will still be the favorites and yeah because pacific will need three new players i yeah i do kind of hope that apex do win it because that would just be very strange <laughs> yeah that would be very strange to have a team who needs three new players it would be bleed but worse basically yes Yes, it wouldn't be good. But those players are probably names that you probably will be learning in the next couple of years because mm -hmm. if they're already doing this at 16, you know. Yeah, from what I have better. seen, Loida looks insane. Comeback looks really good. Uh, yeah, they, they definitely have yeah. some potential. Rose um, looked like a really good sub of player. Yeah, so we'll, we'll you'll be seeing them, I'm sure. And they're, look, they're young Turkish players, so of course someone's going to pick them up in the future. Yeah, That's all we know about EMEA. That's just doomed to happen in EMEA. Maybe one day in EMEA will just be a Turkish league. Maybe. Maybe we'll move it to Istanbul. <laughs> I'm just got a Turkish league going. Anyway, that's EMEA Ascension. Uh, the other regions are starting soon. As we said, America's is starting. Now, you're in America, mm -hmm. so you're an America's expert. What do you think about, and I thought about this before as well, American Ascension has six teams. Yeah. Which is an odd number of teams for a tournament. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what do you think about America's Ascension? Let, let's do a bit of a, a quick preview for it as well. Uh, talk me through America's Ascension and, and your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to be honest. I was so locked into vct and other stuff that i haven't watched any of ascension really i've like peeked at a couple of games here and there or i haven't looked at any tier two i mean throughout the year i've just kind of like yeah. kept tabs on who's good etc um so i mean from the north american portion m80 they were the promised ones at the beginning of the year everybody mm -hmm. kind of expected them to be good they did have the the one big move where they replaced their igl nitro uh with net from formerly the guard and g2 uh but it's you know koala noob nismo xander from last year's m80 plus bcj uh and now net and they have looked like they're pretty dominant uh, across most of the this like last stage and then through the playoffs 
Um, maybe a bit surprising to not see Moist X Shopify make it. Or wait, did they? Wait, hold on. No, no, Moist it's Shopify TSM. Did not make it. Um, Oxygen was the other team that looked like maybe they were going to be kind of like the star standout team from North America. Uh, but yeah, TSM kind of came out of nowhere, which is you know a very some some common names like who've been in in tier two like fighting for tier one for a long time gmd poise to proto uh but then plus plus sim and seven um so interesting to see you know the old tsm name be be at ascension god uh, if tsm make it i mean would riot be must mental. be rooting for tsm to make it that would be mental actually if tsm were to make it just because people would obviously kind of go crazy uh, yeah. for that, even if they weren't that good. Which, to be fair, they got dumpstered by M80 in the kind of like grand final. Uh, they lost 13-8, 13-2 uh, to uh, M80 in the in the kind of grand final of that. So I, I I doubt TSM can overcome M80 personally. If it did, if they did get that far, yeah. Um, but. You never know. You never know. And if TSM did make it, that would be very funny. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm assuming that neither of us know that much about the Latin America teams or the Brazilian teams. Uh, no, not really. Uh, I mean, you can recognize some of the names from some yeah, of the Latin like teams. Yeah, like Nags, yep. Delsic. Yep. God, I mean, we're going great. Adverso used to be on Lev. Yep. Yeah, so you, there's definitely some names in there, some good names that you might recognize, which will be fun to see them play again. Well, that's uh, just also, one think, team. The All Knights, well, Galleries, and two-game esports are just completely unknown players to me, basically, except for Adverso, obviously. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah. But two-game, what a logo. You know what the logo reminds me of? This is a reference for literally just you. Okay. It reminds me of the Ascend. Yeah. Like like the astronaut. wallpaper stuff. Astronaut. Yeah, that yeah. they have. Yeah, maybe I'll just root for two game purely off of that. Um, yeah, but I mean, I'm I'm very excited to watch this actually. Now that I'm sort of like recovered from <laughs> from the from end Valorant of the season. overload. Yeah, uh, I, I plan to watch most of this, and then I I'm super super curious to tune into the other regions as well. And we'll just quickly touch on them just because I know people probably have no idea what's going on <laughs> in in Pacific <laughs> and and other regions as well, unless you're from there um well pacific yeah, I, have gone mental i guess i guess from from america's i think m80 clear favorite that's yes that's just i, you I know, would think so too. As, as good as as you know i'm sure the latam and brazilian teams are uh in their region m80 is a tier one team <laughs> that has been in tier two this whole season basically um and if you just look at like the the history of like galleries and, and two game esports it's not clean you know there's lots of wins lots of losses it hasn't been like a super clean run for either the Brazilian teams. Um, and same thing. I mean, Reda has been pretty dominant in their region, but they still have lost, you know, several times this year. Uh, but I guess M80 has as well. So I, I'm just really curious to see, like, it'll be a good showcase of, of the new talent. Um, and I guess maybe, no, we'll talk about this after we talk about Pacific and um, China because those are also starting very soon as well. Um, mm -hmm. China. Let, let's start with Pacific. Okay. No, I want to start with Pacific because they've got fucking crazy. Okay. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, there are 10 teams in Pacific. Some yeah. of the teams you'll, you'll recognize their name, right? You might've heard of their team, like full sense, right? Like Boom. now we're in it last year. Yeah. Boom. Of course, is a team that went to an international at one point disguise. This is where disguise toast team is now. Yep. Uh, so, you know, there's like teams that you'll probably re recognize in there. Uh, and maybe some names, you know, like Sushi Boys, uh, you know, Foxy from Pulsex, Juicy right? could like, qualify for Ascension twice. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> he was on Bleed last year and now he's on Disguise. Imagine he qualifies for Ascension twice. Yeah. SK Rossi is on uh, Revenant, the Indian team. So, yep. you know, th there's definitely like names and, and faces and teams that you might recognize. But the the way they have gone about it, so it's 10 teams, right? EMEA was also 10 teams. You know how EMEA sorted out 10 teams? They did two groups of five. Yep. into four teams going into playoffs, right? Sensible, sensible shit. Pacific have decided that they're just going to do one bracket yep. that is going to be ordered in terms of, so there's two games that go on first, yep. right? So there's four teams that have to play in an extra round. Yep. And it's based off where the team from last year's Ascension finished. 
So, for instance, False Sense are playing Ob Oblivion Force and Revenant are playing uh, Sinapriza, who also have a very crazy logo that I love. Um, <laughs> what is this? It's just palm trees with a sun. It looks some like steps? something from GTA. It looks sick, to be honest. Uh, anyway, yeah, they're playing each other because of what last team's Ascension teams from their region did. Which was entirely which different, different rosters. Yeah, different rosters, different all. It's like, what? It makes no sense. Um, Sinapriza has it. not lost a game since january by the way good for them and with this <laughs> logo get in the league they get haven't the lost a game since logo. january Although, as we said the riddle order the japanese team who have jojo and sold down names yeah. that you might recognize they've got a sick logo too with just a smiley face so a lot of good logos here riddle order um, uh was a premier team also if i well there you go and, and look correctly. at that fucking logo what a great logo uh so yeah, I, I'm I'm excited to see the fucking chaos that uh, ensues from this this format. I have no idea who fucking cooked this up. They've gone crazy. If you look at it on VLR, yeah. like it just looks fucking mental. <laughs> like the whole thing looks mental just to look at the bracket and the way it's gonna work. Anyway, uh, so yeah, certainly gonna be interesting to say the least. But uh, yeah, good luck to those teams. In of the course, comments, this tell us who you think is gonna win. Is that uh, no idea? I'm gonna go. You know what? I'm gonna say, boom. I'm gonna say boom will win. But boom again, if you're sports. like a really into it, if you're really deep into the Valorant lore, you might know some of their names. Berserks uh, on Shiro. their team. Berserks, famous, used to play for um, fuck, what were they called? It was uh, Monyet played for them as well. What were they called, man? They were actually pretty good, but they always choked. Uh, well, Onyx G. Onyx G. Really? I don't. They, I don't see that in in his VLR. I see Procedure Esports, and I see Boy with Love. It's, are you on Mon yet? No, I'm talking about Famous. Oh, I'm talking about Mon yet. Yeah, but you I said saying, Mon yet. You were saying Famous used to play. Oh fuck, fuck! I um, I'm, I'm. You're off the. Never game. mind. Yeah, I'm off the goop. He didn't play for them. You're right. <laughs> That's my bad. My bad. My bad. Anyway. My my uh, pick is Simprisa. I think they, uh, okay, just they've been very dominant in Korea. Winning. I think they've been very dominant in Korea. But I also wouldn't mind seeing John Olsen and PTC and Foxy mm. and Sushi Boys back in the league. That'd be kind of sick, too. Yeah. Get them back. Okay. There you go. And then finally, China, which I know nothing about. I mean, Rare Atherum in the, are in there, but they've got a different team, I'm sure. Yep. Um, uh, so I've got no idea what's going on. Crystal is playing it. I remember Crystal from last year. Yep. Yeah, he's pretty good. There's the Lai Gaming. Wolfen is playing in China, and Divasic. They're both on Keep Best Gaming. Um, there's been a big, a big move of Eastern Europeans and and Russians playing in China. We saw with like Vukashu, and then I know that um, if you look at a lot of like the coaching staffs of these teams, there's like a smattering of eastern europeans in there as well and i i've heard rumors that there might be even more moves of like russian players to china next year um so that's definitely something to keep an eye out for um keep best gaming is a name that i've seen in other games uh so that'll be interesting uh extreme gaming is a very successful dota organization um i don't know what they're doing in other games uh and then i think i heard was it ambitious legend i mean some of these names are terrible but <laughs> chosen click gaming um That's i think it's ambitious name. legend somebody was saying it was like a really old school like crossfire org it's either them or okay. or, or Qingju club one of those two i can't remember but yeah uh rare <laughs> adam is maybe like the most uh recognizable just because they were in last year's ascension and almost made it yeah and now they're back with a completely different roster uh, including a Korean player. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, if, if China's Ascension is as mental as last year's China was, <laughs> last year's Chinese Ascension, then should be a good show. Imagine Wolfen yeah, gets I'm... back into the league in China. That would be, that'd yeah, be crazy. That would be strange, wouldn't it? I mean, again, some great names, as there always is in China, like Snail. Snail. <laughs> slowly. What yeah. a name. Slowly is a good Imagine... name slowly why are you plays for that team as well oh hell yeah uh attention yeah, some... is the guy's name <laughs> <laughs> ffs yeah ffs and then of course you've got 
you know Zuma. Just... Zuma. Someone's called Zuma. Zuma. Pink. Chaos. There's a link in China. Not not Deep the link. Deep nine. Deep nine. <laughs> That's a good name. Deep nine Zoomer Maple. All right. I'm 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 rooting for chosen clique gaming. <laughs> I hope they make it. Yeah, some great names in there, as I always are. Okay. Let's move on yeah. to our final topic. The most important topic. Yep. Why is Weekly Award? Wait, what? Oh, no. It's oh. it's our 2024 Cosmic Divide. Oh, I, I didn't even fucking put that together. Astro Buff. Let's fucking go. Yeah, let's go. It's our Podcast 2024 Cosmic stocks. Divide. Yeah, awards. <laughs> so, shall we just dive into it? We have, is this the four awards we're giving? Yeah, I was trying to think of other ones, and we could do like you know, map of the year, like performance of the year. But I just figured let's keep it simple. Let's do four, keep unless there's simple. unless there's like one extra or whatever that you you would prefer to do. But no, we've got no, agent no, of the just... year, the most impactful agent. We've got team of the year, the best team of the year, rookie of the year, which we're defining as has never played in VCT before. That's that's the defi- definition. Okay. Uh, and player of the year overall. And that'll be that'll be that. Okay, let's start with Agent of the Year then. Uh, so, interesting, I did my little Discord poll for this as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and most people, when I did my Discord poll, voted for Omen That's to be Agent of think. the Year. Yeah. However, I did not think that Omen was deserving of Agent of the Year. Okay. My reasoning is thus. Basically, I thought that Omen, whilst obviously having the highest pick rate of the entire season, perhaps because Omen's Omen was already good, right, and already had a high pick rate from last season as well. Thus, the change of how people played Omen and what changes happened because of Omen was pretty insignificant. Mm-hmm. Most people just played Omen on maps where Omen was good already. Just yeah. played Omen. And so it was basically the same as it was before. Therefore, in my video, my DMVs, I decided to give Agent of the Year to Cypher. Ooh, that's a good shout. I like that. Yeah, the reason is because I thought that, one, Cypher saw a pretty heavily increased pick rate from uh, seasons prior. And in the maps where Cypher did see pick rate, we saw a lot of new setups. We saw, I think, interesting different ways of... of kind of using Cypher on the attack side as well. Um, and so, yeah, I thought that Cypher... And, and I looked at the map pool as well of the nine maps we had played this year, and pretty much everyone but Icebox, Cypher either is the meta or saw a lot more pick rate than he ever had on those maps before. Mm-hmm. And therefore, I gave it to Cypher. Thoughts? Uh, yeah, I actually hadn't even thought of that, but it, it makes a lot of sense. He was kind of like... At, he got the buff like right before yep. the season, didn't he? Was it right before yeah, the season so. started, something like that, or at the very beginning, um, and then really took a lot of market share away from Killjoy, um, and kind of took over, changed how things were being played a lot. Uh, yeah, uh, I I can agree with that. That's not who I gave mine to, but I can agree. Oh, with go that. on, go on. I want to hear that. So I think for me, um, Sova deserves an honorable mention, but he's not my yes. agent of the year just because okay. Sova really kind of came out of nowhere. Almost everybody, you know, obviously last yes. year was all sky and so was kind of shit, but then people were like, well, we need more information. Let's try out Sova. And then Sova ended up being like really good this year on most maps. Yes. But for me, the agent of the year is Gecko. And the reason for a- okay. for giving Gecko agent of the year, despite him being kind of like a middling, not that high pick rate overall is that Gecko, I think, significantly changed the agent composition on some of the mm. most important maps of the year um, and had presence on most of the maps, at least at some point during the year. Um, just, you know, it, it turns out that having rechargeable utility <laughs> is <laughs> Who'd really have good. Who would have thought? Really Who could have told you that years ago? Yep, that's that's point number one. And point number two is being able to plant from a distance and have your gun out is also extremely important. Plant slash diffuse is also yep. extremely important. I think Gecko fundamentally changed how certain maps were played because of Wingman and because of Dizzy. 
Um, and so I think that he is probably responsible for enabling a huge amount of comp shift and meta shift in, in the overall game. Um, but mm, yeah, I okay. don't, I don't disagree with your cypher take, but no, I but think, I don't yeah. disagree with your gecko take either because gecko was the second most voted agent, mm -hmm. uh, in my discord. So gecko came second. Uh, so clearly a lot of people agree with you uh, and cypher came third, by the way, and Silver came fourth. So all, <laughs> all the agents that you mentioned that we've mentioned, uh, have, have come up. I I'm I'm happy to go with Gecko. I'm happy to defer to you and say let's give it to Gecko because I like Gecko. Gecko's fun. <laughs> yeah, Gecko's a cool agent. Uh, but yeah, yes. I mean, I think we can give out two awards. You can give out yours. I can give out mine. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. We don't even need to do it joint. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's move on then to team of the year. Uh, this one to me is easier. I'm interested to see what see what you say, but okay. I'm just gonna give the Genji. Interesting. Okay. What do you think? Well, give your reasons. Uh, because across I think the entirety of the season, you could argue for Team Heretics. Um, but I think that winning a tournament matters. Mm -hmm. I think it would be strange to give a team of the year to a team that didn't win anything. And so, if you look at the rest of the teams, to me, this is a two horse race. If you're going to argue for someone other than Team Heretics or Gen G, I'm going to question your understanding of the word year mm -hmm. um but yeah i think that gen g were were the best team of the entire season and won a tournament which i think matters okay go on sentinels <laughs> <laughs> no i don't think i can give it to sentinels no. i don't think i can give it to gen g oh because they didn't make it out of groups at the most important tournament of the year. The most important tournament of the year, they didn't make it out of the group stage. What's the difference to finishing second to finishing 12th? Well. Prize money. Go on. Give me the prize money argument. You know what? I don't yeah. know if I have a team of the year. <laughs> Now that I'm thinking about it. Wait, this is what I mean. It has what? to be you. It, it's literally a two horse race. You can't say it's anyone else. It has to be Gen D or Team Heretics. And I can I can buy an argument for Team Heretics, but I think the finishing second constantly, whilst impressive in one sense, I'd rather have a team that won a thing. Yeah, but I think it's strange to have a team of the year that didn't win anything. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, they didn't even win a regional. I mean, you're not wrong, but I didn't win a regional tournament either. Can I really give it to Genji when they didn't make it out of groups? You have to, unless you're going to say EDG, and then Fuck I'm it. just going to say this team was awful for most of the year. <laughs> Fuck it, I'm giving it to EDG. I actually, oh, I actually no. Okay, I, I I thought I had made my decisions, but then I'm I'm thinking about Genji, and it's just they didn't make it out of groups. Oh my god! Yes, but they also won a tournament. I understand that isn't that much more. Do you want me to go through EDG's performances in these other tournaments as well? I mean, I know that they got second at Madrid, and I know that they dominated yeah. Split Two of their region, but they were poo in Split One, and then won the tournament after Split One. I guess they also did win kickoff. Okay, fine, fine. I'll give it to Genji. I don't feel good about it, but I'll give it to Genji. <laughs> this is why, this is why Valorant needs a fucking dynasty, because we can't keep having these conversations where it's like, <laughs> well, this team, they kind of sucked ass at the end of the year. They were kind of shit at champs, but because they won a, a tournament six months ago, they're the best team of the year. I fucking Well, hate... they also had a hard group of champs. Yeah, whatever, man. If you're, if you're the best team of the year, you should be making it out of your champions group stage tournament. Let's move on now that you've agreed to Gen G. Rookie of the year. Tough one. Oh, this is, this, I think it's arguably the toughest, toughest uh, award to give out uh, of all these because there's a lot of good nominees. A lot okay. of good nominees for this one. So um, we're, I personally, we're talking, we're talking Yetta J. We're talking Woot. We're talking Charon. We're talking John Cutie. Yeah. Would you end. include Valen? 
as a rookie. It's kind of hard for me because the guard no, was like he went to it. Yeah, he went yeah. to an international tournament. Yeah, yeah, he's not a rookie. Yeah. Uh, uh my personal choice, and I, I guess you're gonna disagree if you're this anti Gen G, but I would give it to Karen. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't think it's close. Okay. I don't think it's close. I okay. think the only other person that I would want to give it to is Benji Fishy, but he played one game last year. <laughs> yeah. And so he's disqualified for being a rookie. You wouldn't even consider Rienz. No. Really? He's he's really okay. good. He's really, really good. I but but uh I think Benji Fishy is the more impactful player. If we're just talking from like a pure solo performance standpoint, Benji Fishy would have my vote over Rienz. I think the the Heretics roster is crazy because it's like, do you give to Woot? Do you give to Rienz? Do you give to Benji Fishy? Uh but it's Karen, and, and it's not. It's, it's not particularly close. He was the best player in all of Pacific in Stage Two. He won a tournament. <laughs> he was instrumental in their run at the beginning of the season, at Madrid, at Shanghai, and uh, yeah. I mean, he's just fucking nuts. Like, if you look at the stats, you know, you you can look at some of the the players in EMEA, like like a Yeta J, who was really good, but you know, foot never really did anything internationally. You can talk about the IGL work from John Cutie. Um, but it's just, I think it's Karen by like a pretty large margin. Okay. Well, I mean, I also think it's Karen, so that's fine. But I know that a lot of people in my Discord thought it was Rienz. I mm -hmm. think that they were being a bit like uh, recency bias with Rienz mm -hmm. personally, uh, because like my, my the main thing of why I thought Karen uh, like had to kind of win, in my opinion, was because after Shanghai, literally when everyone was making the top 10 list for champs everyone had karen in the top five yeah well there you go right story, <laughs> you're really. putting him in the same like category as like us yeah and you're putting him as a player of the year nominee at that yeah. point so it's like yeah. well at that point it's over isn't it yeah. uh anyway speaking of player of the year let's talk yeah. about player of the year Ooh, this gonna now be this one to me see interesting that you thought the rookie of the year was quite obvious i think that this one was pretty easy to me okay i'm gonna say texture Okay. Do I need to explain texture? Yes, give me your reasoning. Uh, <laughs> don't know if you watched like most games this season. <laughs> nah, I I've just been bullshitting this, on this podcast for the yeah, entire this season. This texture guy, pretty good. He's pretty fucking good. Yeah. Uh, put him on jet. Put him on race. Yep. He often will fucking fry. Um, on either. Yep. Uh, and I think again, like the player of the year to me doesn't necessarily have to like win a thing like I, I don't think rookie of the year or player of the year you have to be on a team that won mm -hmm. um you just have to have played pretty fucking well and it helps if you win obviously as a team if you win a tournament as well which obviously does help textures case uh i think there are arguments that you can make for other people but i think that textures argument of just having played and even in champs texture was even though they they lost you know a couple of their games or whatever and went out pretty unceremoniously texture i still thought was playing pretty well uh and so yeah i think texture just for the entire season pretty much fried and i think also the story is nice and they also won a tournament and therefore he's also funny so everything is leaning for me towards texture but go on tell me tell me who you picked Okay, so I was looking at a variety of different stats, and I was okay. thinking about what I watched this year. And, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people that are just like, you guys are absolutely brain dead. It's Ospos 100%. Um, and maybe there's a lot of people that are agreeing with you. It's obviously texture. Um, what my sort of finalists were, were texture, mm -hmm. uh, Zekin. Yeah. Um, Ospas. Yeah. I put Durka in there because I thought he had a really, okay. really good year individually. Okay. But the winner for me is Kong Kong. And I don't think it's particularly close. <laughs> and here's the reason. Okay. For that. Okay. So obviously we can talk about the finals. The best performance has ever happened in Valorant. Um, actually tying CNED's performance back at Masters 1 for 111 kills in a BO5. But if you look at what Kong Kong was doing for the entire season in terms of his stats, regardless of what the team was doing, he was 
absolutely shitting on everybody. Regionally in China, absolutely shitting on everybody. At Madrid, absolutely shitting on everybody, while the rest of his team was horrendously bad. Shanghai, they bombed out. He was still in the top statistically. Champions, puts it over the edge. He carried them to a trophy, a world championship, by doing the absolute most work possible. And if you look at his agent pool, this is the most interesting thing to me. He did it by reinventing himself as a player. At the start of the year, he played fucking KO on every map. He was their flex flash initiator and Smoggy was their duelist and he was still putting up insane stats. And then he became essentially a neon main and has the best neon stats of anybody in the world, period. For like having a large sample size. So he did not op crutch. He did not rely on jet. He did not rely on rays. He actually played three different duelists and primarily played Neon, who is the new the new one. Uh, and like I said, he was the MVP of champions. He's the best player in the world. Thoughts? I mean, you give a uh, you get you give a compelling argument. I think most people would argue back to you that particularly early on in the Chinese season, you are looking at farmers. <laughs> the the stats versus do I need to bring up early, Madrid? Some of those early Chinese teams, you're just talking about farmers. And even when you bring up Madrid statistically, in my mind, from what I remember thinking about EDG at Shanghai and Madrid, I was thinking, man, this team's awful. Kang Kang is taking a lot of fights. He's yeah. overheating a fuck ton. Yeah. And taking some awful fights. Yeah. So even if his stats are, you know, ACS wise, ADR wise, pretty good, a lot of those fights are shit fights that are mistakes. That's what I remember. Or maybe he had to take them because his team was. Perhaps he shit. did because his team is shit. <laughs> but. But <laughs> and look, and yeah, I'm sure his stats are still good and he won a lot of those fights because he's really good. I mean, I'm just and I'm not I'm, doubting I'm that. Putting this out there, he outfragged texture at every event. Good for him. Yeah, because textures other players get kills. Yeah, so you're saying texture is a good player within the team system, whereas Kong Kong is the best individual player. That's what you're telling me. No. <laughs> no, I'm not saying that. <laughs> Well, thank you. I'm That's cosmic that, divide. <laughs> I'm saying that over the course of this season, yep. if you offered me, do you want texture right now or Kang Kang right now? Mm -hmm. Apart from one day of the season, my answer would always be the same. Well, okay, maybe not the very start of the season. The very start of the season, I didn't realize how good texture was. <laughs> well, let's say, you know, post, post, you know, the first, couple games of Masters of Madrid. Yeah. If you offered me, do you want Texture or Kang Kang for your team? Apart from literally the Champs Grand Final day, I would take Texture. And I would tell you to open your eyes because Kang Kang was... And I would tell you to re-evaluate your eyes because you've got a player who's fucking overheating all the time. And maybe that's because he thinks that he needs to do that. And Texture's he... not overheating all the time? Not all the time, no. I mean... He does sometimes. Yeah, and he still wins a lot of those fights too, but he doesn't all the time. No, definitely not. Nowhere near. Kang Kang, it like what made him so good in the Champs Grand Final is that he didn't overheat as well. He was still just getting all those kills. In fact, I'm pretty sure I saw Nielzinho say that the thing that surprised them in the Champs Grand Final was the fact that Kang Kang didn't overheat, that he was playing like literally almost flawless Valorant. Like he was all he was aggressive when he needed to be, and he was not aggressive when he also didn't need to be. Because for the rest, of, and the reason that's a surprise to Neil Zeno, for the rest of the fucking season, he would just fucking overheat. And yeah, he wins a lot of fights against a bunch of farmers. Of course he does. He's really good. But for most of the season, I would take texture. And this is a like, uh, player of the year award. Give me texture. Fuck it, we'll disagree. I don't care. Let's end the show. TMV. We both made a huge mistake. The real answer is my goat tens. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. True.